From Transport Topics in Washington, D.C., this is Road Signs. And now here's your host, Michael Fries. Thank you for listening to Road Signs, the podcast series from Transport Topics that explores the trends and technologies that are shaping the future of trucking. In today's episode, let's talk diversity, specifically diversity in the trucking industry and those inclusion efforts that some in the industry are trying to achieve to fill that gap between the driver recruitment retention problem and also the technician problem as well. In this episode, we'll ask the simple question, how can the trucking industry become more inclusive? What do those efforts look like and how do we define success? To answer that question, we have someone very qualified in inclusion and diversity in the industry. Please welcome to the Road Science Podcast, April Rye, President and CEO of the Conference of Minority Transportation Officials, or better known as COMTO. April, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, we're excited to have you. Uh, you know, one one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on, you know, diverse. I mean, diversity is is a often talk about, especially nowadays, an often talk about um, point when it comes to the workforce in general. And and then in your space, you know, you are the president and CEO of an organization that 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 ensures the participation of minority individuals, veterans, people with disabilities, minorities, women, and disadvantaged business enterprises. I mean, so you, you covered the whole gamut of that. But aside from that, uh, you know, brief description, could you discuss the role of Comto and, and how this relates to the trucking industry? Absolutely. So it's been about 50 years now, over 50 years that Comto uh, has been doing this work. And really, the whole goal of Comto is to ensure that transportation as a whole meets the needs of everyone. And, and that really is across all modes of transportation from logistics um, to highways and airplanes and maritime industry and everything in between. And really that means that the leadership and workforce of this industry has to reflect the community served. And so really that means that we embrace all of the differences that make each one of us unique. And we bring that to our work every day. Um, with regard to our backgrounds and, and our experiences. And so we have 40 chapters across North America um, and are proud to have Secretary Buttigieg call us the voice for equity in transportation. So really we're trying to focus on knowledge sharing and partnership opportunities and networking so that we can share what has been working well and what right looks like in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion across the transportation industry. Well, it's always nice to get a, a, a special desig designation from Secretary Pete. So, so that's yes, <laughs> so that it's a great tagline. Yes, that, that, that is a great tagline. Now that that um, you know, having that you know the, the designation and just the, the the work that you do, April. You know, that is the the beginning of all this. But when it, when when it when it comes to those the, the steps, you know, when when people like I said before earlier, when people hear the word diversity and inclusion, you know, some lately it's been more of a, a loaded phrase. Maybe mainly because you know it's the unknown, and it's something you know you you have the people, but the concept itself is, is is pretty abstract. You know, what are those beginning considerations and steps in this particular process when when it comes to a fleet becoming more inclusive? I appreciate that, and I just want to start by saying I completely agree with you that that word diversity it's a loaded term, but you know, funny enough, it's always been a loaded term. So anyone in this industry in this space who's been working on equity or championing diversity initiatives knows that you can fall in and out of favor uh, very quickly. But really, diversity is about serving the community. It's really about community. That's really what it's about. And that word diversity means all the people who make up a community and how to better serve them. So if you think about getting people to work and having good jobs that take care of people's families, we have to think about all the considerations of people with different backgrounds what they would need to be able to take advantage of opportunities. And so as we think about uh, being more inclusive and diverse in this industry, specifically in, in trucking and logistics, we have to think about this from a holistic approach. And, and it's really looking at the business from all sides. So we have to address the most pressing issues. So if we think about the trucking industry, still one of the top issues facing trucking is recruiting our driver shortage uh, and then retention, retaining drivers in the workforce. And, and from a recent study I saw, 64,000 drivers were needed to really move this industry forward. That's a big gap. 
And so if we look at where we're at now in terms of actively recruiting for drivers, where are we looking? That's the first step. We have to broaden our, our search and our net in, in actively searching for persons to consider a career in logistics. What you had just said, you know, just from you know past interviews when we were talking about this particular subject, especially with recruitment, and you know, we get to the, the the point of you know meeting the people where they're at. And I think that's what you're you're implying. I mean, with, with that, just sort of looking in those particular areas that that have been searched before. But, but is that is that the uh, is that a major pain point when when you are talking about inclusion to to fleets? I feel like it is because, you know, if you think about many organizations and agencies, many people do the same thing that they've always done before simply because that's the process. And a lot of times those processes are not revisited. So if you think about this, if you talk to any organization, any business, and they say, oh, okay, we have a job opening. There's a person who goes to their system and goes ahead and puts that application or that call out to all the places that they've done before, because that's simply the process. Very rarely is that process uncovered. Like, have you ever picked up a rock on the ground and then you uncover it and you see a whole a whole ecosphere underneath that rock, right? There's all these things happening. It's very rare that businesses will uncover their process and take a look at it and say, can we make any adjustments here? So it, it's kind of crazy to think that you would get a different result from doing the same thing. And that's one specific starting point as organizations think about where am I looking for talent? Am I just doing the same thing I've always done? Or am I willing to be a little innovative and to be very intentional about putting that same opportunity in a different person's hands? And so thinking about who are the organizations, agencies, educational institutions who may have a more broad network of people to share that opportunity with it is a great step one. Yeah, th- 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 I'm glad that you that you mentioned that, April. Just for the the natural fact, when when you when you you know you're in a position to discover a company's blind spot <laughs> when it comes to that, and and but you know but but in doing that, you know, the, the company of course doesn't see that because I mean. It, it's it's the blind spot, <laughs> and and when you present this 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 data and information to them, I would ask if, if it's more of a denial or is it more of oh my goodness we need to take care of this right now? I mean, or is it somewhere in between? It's more of that because remember we're solving a problem here, we're we're focused on an issue. Um, I haven't met one organization or agency that says you know we're pretty good on the hiring side we've got all the people we need we're doing great we're busting at the seams with applications <laughs> i have not met one organization or agency who said that to me okay and so that's the fact we're solving a problem and so as they say you know we're really having a hard time getting qualified applicants uh for these positions and we say hey have you looked here here or here and they're like oh no i don't think we share our opportunities there and I say, well, if you do, you'll be shocked at the results. You'll get some new folks. <laughs> and they say, what? And they're happy. They're excited. So no, it's, it's an excitement to kind of broaden their perspective because we're solving a business decision. As we said before, the word diversity is kind of a loaded term. But when we bring it into business terminology, we're solving a business problem. Then people are more open. Okay. So on that road to, to, uh, to solving this business problem, Um, you know, and as you said, you know, there's a certain level of enthusiasm and that enthusiasm gap is very important as well. Um, what, how can you take that bottle, that lightning in the bottle that you have when it comes to, uh, solving diversity, what areas do you put into the roles of implementation and and measuring and managing expectations? So part of that is looking at your process and your results. So if you're trying to fill a gap, and you need more drivers, you need more people, um, and you're doing outreach, and you are hopefully um, having people respond to those applications, and you're holding interviews, part of the metrics is, okay, where are the places that we have posted this? How many applicants have we received? Of those applicants, how many got through the first stage, second stage of the interview process? And then What are some of the differences that make up those applicants? What are their backgrounds? How many women did we get? How many persons of color? Did we get anyone with a a disability? Being able to use that um, as as metrics, I think is a great way to showcase just 
how far you're going um, with that goal. And it's important to make sure to me that goals are smart. And I'm not sure if you if you're familiar with that term, but specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So a smart goal being those things will ensure that you're going to reach reach your goals. Because just being super broad and saying, I just want to diversify our pool of applicants. Okay, that's super, super broad. But it's until you make that tangible that you can determine if you're moving in the right direction. And the other thing is, once you get people in the door, how long are they staying with you? And are they advancing within their role? Are they able to move into a supervisory capacity? Or do, you, or do they leave within the first year? Um, so being able to take it beyond just the first step as well will help you create processes that will benefit you down the road. Hello, Roadside listeners. Dan Ronan here from Transport Topics. I'm here to tell you about our new extended cuts of the Road Signs podcast. If you like what you learn here, I think you're going to really love this. So what is the Road Signs extended cut? Well, instead of ending the recording and saying our guest farewells, we're keeping our expert guests around for an extra one or two questions to gather a deeper, fuller picture of the influential topics in transportation. We capture that insight and convert it into a printable download that will help you navigate the latest trucking trends and guide your next business decision. Considering the easy, linkable, and printable format, you can keep the extended cut for your next big meeting, send it to your friends and colleagues, or pack it up for your next big conference. So how do you get the latest download? Well, it's real simple. Visit ttn.ws forward slash extended cut. That's ttn.ws forward slash extended cut. So in, in that in that particular process, I mean, you had brought something up uh, the, the latter in your in your answer where you're you're looking for the differences. Um, does do companies uh, have toward uh, have some goals toward you know having those people uh, having minorities in positions of leadership, or this is or, or is it more getting in on the trucking, getting more on the technician level, back office level, and then then rising up from there? It's definitely both. So organizations and, and agencies definitely have goals to diversify their candidate pool and get people in the door. Um, but then there's also interest, which is exciting, for those ones to rise up in the ranks and get into a decision-making position. And so, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to be the CEO, but are they in a decision-making role? Are they a, in a supervisory role? Um, it's really, really important. And, and that means that you have to look beyond just that initial outreach process, right? And it's about making sure that the culture of the organization supports the differences in our employees. And so that can look different in, in many different ways for an organization. There's no one size fits all. But does that mean that you acknowledge uh, recognized months like Black History Month or Hispanic Heritage Month? Or does it mean that you offer special bonuses and incentives um, or uh, benefits for your employees that maybe are outside of the norm just because it helps to support people, maybe who's a caregiver or maybe someone who has children um, or maybe it's a person with a disability who needs a very, you know, a, a very small accommodation to be able to do well. All of those things can contribute to a culture of inclusivity that makes a person feel comfortable bringing their full self to work um, and supporting their personal responsibilities back at home. You know, April, I want to talk about the the, the challenges in that implementation. Um, but before we do that, I, 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 I just want to ask you, when uh, the disadvantaged business enterprises, what what is that designation? What does that entail? Yeah. And so really what we mean by that is uh, businesses that are owned or, or major, majority owned by women, uh, persons of color or persons with disabilities like veterans, um, disabled veterans. So those organizations are designated as disadvantaged. Um, and they're also uh, pretty rare to have an organization that is led uh, by a woman, by a minority, or a person with a disability. So those uh, businesses receive special designation at the state and federal level. And uh, one of the things that we try to do at Compto is to support those businesses in really getting 
of their fair share of contracting opportunities, um, which really strengthens the entire workforce uh, because we know that small businesses, they employ people from their regions and in, in, in their states. Um, and people with strong employment make for strong families and for strong communities. So we always look to support those small businesses. So you you are supporting the whole ecosystem when it comes to to, to hiring, uh, you know, and, and having participation by minority individuals. So this this is, runs the gamut and and all of that with with uh, with the uh, the DBEs. So uh, that's 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 very that's very nice to know uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, helpful. Uh, one of the things, uh, like I said before, you know, I, I kind of want to get into the, the the details of just sort of the struggles in implementation. You know, you you, you set out April. The, the goals for companies and you gave us various examples. Uh, where are some of those uh, those speed bumps that are in the road when, when it comes to implement, implementation? Well, I think part of it is just understanding um, some of our employees who are underrepresented or some of those groups that are underrepresented in our field. What are some of those barriers and challenges? And so, you know, in talking about trucking, we know that women um, are starting to join this industry a little more than they have in the past. But some of the issues persist. And, and part of that is really about stereotypes, prejudice, um, and really safety risks um, and having adequate facilities for uh, women in, in the industry. And so if you think about this, we're talking about um, safety risks and a person feeling safe while they're at work and being able to do their work in a safe environment. Um, and so in thinking about implementation and being able to retain a person who is a woman in the industry, what can be done? Well, is there a way that you can adjust the training? Um, I know specifically as I was um, looking at a couple of message boards, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the platform Reddit, but sometimes there's some interesting commentary on that platform. And there was um, a female truck driver who was just talking about uh, how the process of training can be a little awkward because many times the, the trainees are cooped up with a supervisor over days and weeks and, and kind of inadequate sleeping quarters and facilities. And so this is one of those pain point areas where can an organization take a look at this? Is there a way to adjust the training process where adequate facilities for sleeping can be arranged? Is there a way to make it more professional where maybe there's a third person who's a part of the training or could it be same gender option of, of training uh, for a person? These are specific areas of pain that could be addressed that could maybe allow for uh, different genders to be interested in this industry. And, and one person said, you know, if you've ever been a truck driver and you turned on a CB radio, turn it on and watch what happens when a female driver's voice is heard. It's cringeworthy. This is what someone said. So these are some of the things that, that they have to deal with. And, you know, it really the most important initiatives are leadership led. So how does leadership respond to these types of things? Are they taken seriously? Are folks treated professionally from all aspects, aspects from the top down makes a huge impact uh, on folks at lower levels. And really it's about showing people what right looks like. And it starts from leadership. So those are just some of the things to think about. Those, those I'm, I'm glad you, you brought up the, the, the safety issue when, when um, bringing in you know, women, and in, into in trucking, and I'm, I'm sure there's there's a there's a, a nuance for every uh, group that you bring in. You know, like for example, if you're bringing in, um, you know, just a, an immig an immigrant who comes to this country, and you know, there's a nuance of communication barrier. So there's there's those little there's those those little. I mean, okay, so there's there, there's some there's some nuances in that, and and I just you know, does I mean, does that all come down to leadership? I mean, just sort of you know just handling that problem. Um, with, within your fleet. I mean, because those those little nuances, if not corrected, could be huge problems down the, down the line. That's what I've seen. I've seen anytime new initiatives or initiatives related to equity, diversity, and inclusion are implemented across a business or across an agency, you know, part of the salient things that I've seen that are best practices is when it's leadership-led and data-informed. So if you're getting feedback from your from your employees at the technical level, and that feedback is taken in, it's acknowledged, and it turns into action at the leadership level, it really has a ripple effect across the business. And so when these things are heard that, oh, you know, a driver was harassed over the radio, or oh, somebody, you know, we, we had a complaint about a, a training protocol, 
is that heard? Is it even acknowledged? And I realized that in larger organizations, there could be several, there could be many, and not every single thing can be addressed immediately. Is it even heard or acknowledged? Sometimes that is 75% of the problem is acknowledging that it's been heard and that it is being addressed. And so I think sometimes as CEOs and as presidents, we can get a little flustered when we think about the plethora of communications and feedback that we receive, but not every single thing has to have a solution tomorrow. Sometimes just acknowledging that you heard it and that it's on your mind and that you're thinking through the proper solutions can really make a person feel acknowledged. Um, and then as you determine the best way to approach you know, a solution, it really makes an employee feel valued when they say, you know what, I brought that issue and now look at what they're doing. They're implementing this new training protocol or there's a new communication protocol or we're being given this new tool that helps us feel safe. It really makes them feel valued. And, and that's when you start talking about high retention. Hey, Road Signs listeners, it's your man, Mike Freeze, here to tell you that the call in lines are open. What does that mean, you may ask? Isn't this a podcast, not a radio show? You're correct. Well, we found a new way that you can call in and leave myself or my co-host, Seth Clevenger, a message. Leave us a message on new topics you'd like to hear more about or ask questions you may have about the trucking industry. Give us a ring at ttn.ws forward slash speak pipe. You know, when, when it comes to that CEO frustration and just a, a management frustration when it comes to things like inclusion and diversity, you know, I, I, I you know, just from the the CEOs and the presidents that I've talked to, uh, just with any situation, the the uh, the frustration often comes from a, a lack of vision when it comes to defining success. April, my question to you is, how do fleets when, when um, implementing inclusion into their fleets, how, how do they know when to take a victory lap? So this is a great question. And I think it goes back to the pain points. So if you look at the issues, and we, we said this earlier, this is a business issue that we're looking to, to fix. So if the problem is you don't have enough workers to meet client demands, when you start filling up that workforce pipeline with people because you've broadened your search and now you're getting all these additional applications in from qualified candidates, then you could take a victory lap because now you have more qualified candidates in your pool. And then it's kind of cherry and icing on the cake when those candidates are from diverse backgrounds and can provide a, a, a fresh perspective to the work. In addition, as you look at retention numbers and the number of years that a person stays with your organization, it feels good. And as you see the feedback from those employees come back that they appreciate this or that initiative or this or that bonus or new financial program or whatever it is that you've implemented and you're getting positive feedback from your employees, that's phenomenal. So I think it really comes down to looking at your pipeline. Is it full? Are you getting qualified candidates? Um, are those candidates representing fresh perspectives from different backgrounds? And are those people remaining? Do they stay with you? Um, and, and while they're with you, are they happy? You know, one of the things, April, that, that, um, that the leaders have talked to me about is the fact that it, it, when you have a diverse workplace, you know, in, in a boardroom, in, in the, 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 the bay shop, or, you know, just with a, a fleet of drivers, that, that ultimately helps that business out. And just in, in the sense of, uh, you know, more than... That the dollars and cents of it, but just more of a, you know, a cultural standpoint, and also a you know uh, the, the culture of the business uh, you know is, is benefiting as well. I mean, have you seen evidence of that when when it comes to inclusion? One hundred percent, one hundred percent, and it's not even just me. The science proves it. I mean, data has shown that women are more attentive and cautious as drivers. Um, that they tend to remain with the company longer. Uh, they're involved in fewer incidents. They have better communication skills and they're meticulous about truck maintenance. So if you think about all of those things from a business perspective, of course I want to hire as many women as I can in this industry, not only because of the fresh perspectives that helps to drive you know, ingenuity, 
but also from the dollars and cents perspective about how many times do I have to get this truck fixed and was maintenance an issue and how, how, how much is my insurance rising because of the number of accidents? Those are things that come down to the bottom line and it really helps make a business case for diversity. And I'm glad you had mentioned that, April, in the sense that uh, it takes a, 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 an inclusive environment to, to have uh, optimal, optimal results when, when, when um, working within the, the fleet. Uh, April, for our last question and before we get you out of here, I, I want you to put your analyst hat on. As for the, the, the general industry of trucking and, and achieving diversity, what are some of the things that you think that the trucking industry is underestimating? Well, I think it's about the benefits. And, and like I've, I've said throughout our chat, it's, it's all about the business bottom line. So as trucking companies have the opportunity to increase their talent pool, meet client demand, um, be able to increase their revenue because they've had less incidents, um, they've had a better track record, that's going to boost business. And who doesn't want that? So I think the benefits is the biggest underestimation. And then as we've stated before, having different perspectives at the decision-making table, it pushes innovation. And so if you have everyone who has the exact same background coming to the decision-making table, you're going to get the exact same decision every single time. But if someone with a different perspective and a different experience pushes the boundaries, it's going to make you more innovative in your work. It's going to make you think about new opportunities, new tools, new trends, things that will broaden your own perspective. That's why we don't have friends who look the exact same. We have friends from a variety of backgrounds, and it just makes life more colorful and beautiful. So as organizations and agencies think about the benefits of diversity, all they have to do is take a look at their pain points and the bottom line. And having diverse backgrounds at the decision-making table helps to solve all of that. So that's a, that's a you know a, a solution that most companies can can get behind, especially when you when you relay to them that and having a more inclusive workplace, you know that's going to you know like you said that's going to help the bottom line, and uh, you know that's I think that's a a great bow to tie on on this conversation. Um, we've been speaking with April Rye, President and CEO of Comto, the Conference of Minority Transportation Officials. April. It was great to have you on. Uh, thanks for making us smarter. This was a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And we realize that this is not easy work sometimes, and that's why you have partners and associations like Compto. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's ever any advice we can we can provide or examples or even connect you with a colleague, another business who's done it well. And you can visit us at compto.org. And my email address is right on the, the website. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Did you know you can ask Alexa to open transport topics? In just one minute, you will hear the biggest trucking headlines of that day. Be prepared and start your morning off right with transport topics. Before we close, let's take a moment to revisit the original question. How can the trucking industry become more inclusive? Yes, it is a simple question, but as the words inclusive and diversity are becoming somewhat of a loaded hot button term, it's necessary to know the why of this subject and how it pertains to the trucking industry. According to most estimates, up to 9% of truck drivers are female, nearly 20% are Hispanic or Latino, and roughly 13% are Black or African American. As our guest April Rye from Comto told us, Achieving diversity in the workplace is not a method of checking in a box. It's an opportunity for companies to have a real-world microcosm of what our community is currently. Having different genders, races, and cultures in the workplace brings together those different experiences to make them more shared experiences that will ultimately help companies hold a stronger input in the decision-making process internally and externally. The face of America is continually changing. The U.S. workforce should also reflect that. If you enjoyed this episode of Road Signs, please let others know. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If my questions have sparked questions of your own, share them with the Road Signs team or reach me on Twitter at Michael V. Fries. You can email us at share at ttnews.com. We'll read them and respond daily. Also, let us know how we're doing by texting TT Survey to 571 622 
01. And of course, we'll be back in two weeks with a new episode of Road Signs. Until then, I'm Michael Freeze. Thank you for listening. 